talk a little bit about the real definition of the problem here. I was one of those Republican senators that President Obama invited out to dinner, and I just really appreciated the outreach. I even appreciated more the fact that, based, you know, with the help of my prodding, the president made his staff available to us to try and find those areas of agreement. Maybe there was a grand bargain out there, but at least let's figure out some things we can agree on, enact some fiscal discipline to try and start solving these problems. So he made, he made staff available, and for my part, I certainly brought my accounting skills to bear, plus my problem-solving skills. And you know, what's the first step in any problem-solving process? Identify the No, the first one is admit you have one. You kind of raise your hand, you know, my name's Ron Johnson. Well, you know, when people are saying Social Security is solvent, it's not, they're not getting it. Or when the president says that Medicare only requires modest reforms. You know, behind closed doors, the president did admit to us that the problem with Medicare is for every dollar that gets paid in the system, Americans get $3 out in benefits. And he said, most Americans don't understand that. Well, that's respect for this president. That's because publicly the only thing you say about Medicare is it just requires modest reforms. The Medicare deficit over the next 30, 30 years would be about $35 trillion. Okay? So what I was talking about is, guys, we don't have a 10-year budget window problem. I mean, all these things are I scored over 10 years. It dramatically understates the problem. So even though it's true, over the next 10 years, the deficit, according to CBO's alternate fiscal scenario, which when I look at the data, looks like the most likely scenario, says we'll have about $8 trillion of deficit over the next 10 years. I don't know whether we get by the next 10 years without hitting a debt crisis. This is massive. But it pales in comparison to the second decade when the deficit's going to be $31 trillion, potentially. Or the third decade when it's leached to $88 trillion for a whopping total over 30 years of $127 trillion. We, we put dollars to the percentage of GDP that CBO has in their ultimate fiscal scenario. Now, I said earlier that 100 years doesn't seem like a very long time period. My little baby just turned 30. Yeah. It went by in the blink of an eye. This is, the, this is the relevant problem time period. This is the demographic problem we have where you've got baby boomers retiring at the rate of 10,000 baby boomers per day. We've made all these promises to. We haven't made adequate provision to pay these promises. That's the problem we have. We've got a demographic problem over 30 years, not a 10-year budget winner problem. But again, you know, I realize $127 trillion, I mean, Americans just look at that. They, they can't comprehend it. So let me put it in perspective. The entire net private asset base of the United States, all assets held by businesses large and small, and every household, is $106 trillion. So again, I'm, I'm not guaranteeing that the deficit's going to be 127 trillion dollars. I don't think we can. I don't. There's no way we can do that. But this is the path we're on right now. It needs to be fixed and addressed sooner rather than later. Now, when I was in the White House, in one of those meetings, President Obama actually came in the second half of about a two-hour meeting. This is pretty much after I'd completed our model that showed about 107 trillion dollars of deficits. Not the CBO. This is our own model. We showed 107. And my plea to the president was, again, first step in solving a problem, if you have one, let's, let's agree on the numbers. And then our first act of public bipartisanship needed to be to go to the American public with the agreed upon numbers and prepare the American people for the solution. You know what his answer was to me? He said, Ron, if we show the American public numbers that big, they're going to throw their hands up, they're going to give up all hope. Which, you know, I have to admit, he, he makes a point. <laughs> but, he, but, he, but he also wanted to say, besides, Ron, we can't do all the work. We've got to leave some work for future presidents, future congresses. <laughs> now, now, my point would be, how about, how about we do just a little bit of it? You know, just a little bit of heavy lifting. But anyway, so this is, this is the massive problem that a guy like me went to Washington to try and fix, to take the tough votes. And what is depressing to me personally is I'm not getting a chance to take the tough votes to fix the problem. No, that's what's sad. Here, here's the chart that really keeps me awake at night. This is what I call a graphic depiction of a debt crisis. What it's showing is that from the year 1970 to 1999, the federal government, on average, paid 5.3% for its debt. 5.3% interest rate. Now, Pretty reasonable interest rate, right? If you've got a mortgage, you're, you're probably right around that range. This, by the way, was when, was when America was a far more creditworthy nation. Our debt to GDP ratio then was between 60 or 40 and 67 percent. 
Now it's over 100%. For the last four years, because we're the world's reserve currency, we got the printing press, we're printing money, we're delaying our day of reckoning, we're keeping interest rates artificially low at 1.5%. And by the way, there's some real victims to that. If you're a senior on fixed, fixed income, maybe you had an annuity that was at 4, 5, 6%. It's rolling over. Now, now what are you invested in? What kind of interest rate can you get now? How, how about your young person? You're looking at these numbers and go, boy, I better be responsible and save for my retirement. You know, I'm going to invest in the stock market. Boy, I want a balanced portfolio. I, I want some risk-free assets. What, what, what risk-free bond can you invest in that gives you any kind of return so you can take advantage of compound interest? There aren't any. You know who the beneficiary, of course, of this is government. Government's not feeling the pain of this gross fiscal mismanagement. So, what's a debt crisis? Well, debt crisis is what, of course, Spain and Italy and Portugal and Ireland and Greece. That's what they hit when creditors from around the world looked at those economies and said, you know, you guys aren't serious about fixing your fiscal situation here. You're a credit risk. We're not going to loan you any more money. Well, we're not immune from that. If that would have happened in the U.S., if interest rates were to quickly spike to 5.3%, that would add $650 billion per year to our interest expense. $650 billion. That's more than we spend on defense. It's more than we spend on Medicare. It's 65% of that discretionary spending amount that we always argue over. If you add it to our current debt level, which is a little more than $200 billion, you're close to $900 billion in interest expense alone. That's not only a debt crisis, that's a, that's a political crisis. As our interest on our debt, which would have to be paid, crowds out all this other spending that Americans have become addicted to. And that's the truth. Americans have become addicted to government. And of course, the problem for a fiscal conservative like me, I mean, the other side, I always say, you know, I'm a sales guy. And here's the sales channel. The other side is giving away candy. And it's tasty stuff. You know, as a fiscal conservative, I'm, I'm in the unenviable position of pointing out, well, I know you like that candy, but have you noticed? It's caused a cavity. It's abscess. It's infecting the body. I've got the drill and the Novocaine to fix it. It's a lot harder to sell the drill and the Novocaine than just promising more candy. But that, that's what's being promised to America. So this is the end of my fiscal or my budget charts. I've got two more sets of charts.